Good morning, Five Points Community Church. Would you please turn in your scriptures with me to Psalm 132? And please remain standing with me for the reading of the Word of God. Remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardship that he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house nor get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard it in Ephrathah. We found it in the field of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with, with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, you did not, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. For the Lord swore to David a sure oath, from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion, and he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. This is God's word for God's people. You may be seated, and would you pray along with me? Father, as we consider your word this morning and the promises that jump off the page to us, as we consider the saints of old as they were marching up into Jerusalem, and we see how this passage Screams the name of Christ to us. And Lord, as we consider the year that has gone and the year that lay ahead of us and all that we do not know what lays ahead for us, and yet we know that your word will stand true. We know that your salvation is sure and confident. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless the reading and the study of your word this morning, and that your promises would be true today as they are every day to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, for 12 years of his life, the English nonconformist Puritan pastor named John Bunyan sat in prison. And he sat in prison because he refused to bow to the teaching of the Church of England, which he considered to be errant and false. During his time in prison, he wrote what has been called the first English novel. Uh, many of you probably have read it before, called The Pilgrim's Progress, which is an allegorical story of a pilgrim's journey of faith. And, and in Bunyan's story, the, the pilgrim's name is, uh, appropriately, his name is Christian. And along his journeys, Christian meets a variety of trials and calamities, and the characters that he meets in the story are named after a certain attribute, whether it be positive or negative. Towards the, the, the middle part of the story, Bunyan writes about Christian, and he's, he's on his journey to the celestial city, having left behind the city of destruction from whence he came, and he finds himself standing before a hill called Difficulty. Listen to what Bunyan writes. Now when he was got up to the top of the hill, there came two men running to meet him, the name of the one was Timorous, and of the other, Mistrust. To whom Christian said, Sirs, what is the matter? For you run the wrong way. Timorous answered that they were going to the city of Zion and had got up to that difficult place. But, said he, the further we go, the more danger we meet with. Wherefore we turned and are going back again. Yes, said Mistrust, for just before us lie a couple of lions in the way, 
Whether sleeping or waking, we know not. And we could not think that if we came within reach, but that they would presently pull us into pieces. Then said Christian, Sirs, you make me afraid, but whither shall I fly to be safe? For if I go back to mine own country that is prepared for fire and brimstone, I shall certainly perish there. If I can get to the celestial city, I am sure to be in safety there. So I must venture forth. To go back is nothing but death. To go forward is fear of death and life everlasting beyond it. I will yet go forward. So mistrust and timorous ran down the hill, but Christian went forward on his way. As we come to this passage of scripture, uh, this psalm this morning, Psalm 132, is the longest of what is called the Psalms of Ascent. As the people are making their annual pilgrimage into the city of Jerusalem, and they are singing these songs one to another, rejoicing in the salvation that God has brought them. And Psalm 132 is nestled towards the end of the Psalms of Ascent, and it's nestled in this, uh, this group of psalms, which actually were sung after the people had finally arrived in Jerusalem. So this is a psalm celebrating that they had finished their pilgrimage, and they had now made it to the temple. And like Christian, in the Pilgrim's Progress, this psalm was sung rejoicing that something better lay ahead of them. Their confidence in knowing that God had provided a home for them. Now, their journey had been difficult, though, though they knew that there was more in store for them that would be a trial. The people were here in Psalm 132 rejoicing that God had provided a home for them. So to give you a, a, a layout of the psalm, Verse 1 through 5 of Psalm 32 is the prayer of the people of Israel concerning David. And verse 6 through 10 is the prayer of the people of Israel concerning the temple. And in response, verse 11 through 12 is Yahweh's answer to the people's prayer concerning David. And 13 through 18 is God's answer to the people regarding the temple. So a more simplified outline may look like this. Verses 1 through 10 of Psalm 132 is the prayer of the people, and verse 11 through 18 is God's answer, and his answer is a great promise. Let us dig into this psalm this morning. Verse 1 through 5, Remember, O Lord, in David's favor all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord and a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So here we see this psalm begins with the word remember. And in scripture, when the people of God are calling God to remember, of course, they're not saying, God, we know you forgot. And we're trying to, 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 to you know, remind you of your promise. It is um, sort of asking God to bring it to the forefront of his mind and say, Lord, we are asking that you would reflect now upon the promise that you made on behalf of David. And they, they, they say this word, right? Remember all of the hardships that David endured. Now, certainly, if you consider the life of King David, uh, he had a blessed life. He had a prosperous life, but he certainly also endured hardships. Right? His sons, one killed the other. We know that two, can you imagine if two chapters of scripture were given to your heinous sin of adultery and murder? David had to, in his, early in his life, had to flee from King Saul as he pursued him in order to take his life. So though David's life certainly was prosperous and blessed, it was also very difficult. But here at the beginning of Psalm 132, they are specifically speaking of David's commitment to build God a house. If you flip over to 2 Samuel chapter 7, that is where this psalm is, is, is birthed out of, this account of David wanting to build God a temple. And 2 Samuel 7 recounts uh, David, after he has been given rest from his enemies, he turns to the prophet Nathan, 
And he says, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. He's recognizing that he's living in this glorious kingly palace, and yet the ark of God is sitting in a tent. And he says, this, this should not be the way that things are. And so Nathan's response in 2 Samuel 7, Nathan turns to David and says, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So the prophet blesses David and his endeavors and says, everything that you have just said to do, go and do it. But then at that moment, God steps in and says to the prophet Nathan, he says, you tell David that I have never desired a house. I've never asked him to build me a house. I've been dwelling in tents from the day that Israel had left Egypt and God promised to David that, in fact, he would not be the one to build God a house, but rather it would be his son. God told David, your son after you will build me a house. And so though David wouldn't, uh, would not be the one to build the temple for the Ark of the Covenant, David did everything that he could to, to, to gather together the supplies that eventually King Solomon would use to build the temple of God. He gathered all the wood, he gathered all the, the linens, all the materials that Solomon would need to construct a house for God. We know that when Solomon finished the temple and dedicated it to God, people from all over the area came to see this glorious temple that Solomon had built. We also know, as you continue to read forward in the story of Scripture, that, that that temple, it's not standing anymore. That temple was destroyed when the Babylonian Empire came in and tore it to the ground. As the northern and southern kingdoms were exiled by God's enemies and by their enemies, Israel was sacked and destroyed, and the temple along with it. And then after the time of the exile... During the, the, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah account when King Cyrus of Persia allowed a remnant of the people of Israel to return back. And Ezra and Nehemiah recount the story of the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the wall and the rebuilding of the temple. And yet it also says that when those who were alive during the time of Solomon's temple saw the second temple, they wept because it could not live up to the glory of the temple that Solomon had built. We know that God, he fills the heavens. Nothing on this earth could possibly consume God's presence. Nothing on this earth that human hands can build could fully encapsulate God. And yet God longed to have a place where he would dwell with his people. Look at verse 6 and verse 7. The psalmist writes, Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah, and we found it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place, and let us worship at his footstool. So here the, the psalm shifts from speaking of the temple as a whole to, sh to, to, to dwelling upon the history of the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, the Ark was the place where God resided specifically in the tabernacle as the people roamed throughout the wilderness. Ephrathah was uh, another word for Bethlehem, of course, where David was born, and as we just celebrated Christmas, the place where Jesus Christ would be born centuries later. And this idea of this, this city of Jaar is also an abbreviation for a city called Kirath Jerim, which, uh, again, if you look back to the story of 2 Samuel, after the ark had been captured by the Philistines, and they had taken it into the temple of Dagon, and then we, as we studied a few months ago, uh, this idea of, of the ark becoming a pestilence to the people of the Philistines, and they sent it back. They said, we got to get rid of it because it, it was causing plagues to burst out. And when the ark was returned to Israel, it did not make its way back to the tabernacle. Rather, the ark settled in this place called Jaar. 
and it says it, it settled into the tents of a man named Abinadab, and for 20 years the ark remained in his house, brought great blessing to him and to his family, but the reality of the ark sort of disappeared from the mindset of the Israelites, and they forgot where they put it. It was lost, right? If you're an, an Indiana Jones fan, you know he was all the fan about finding the ark of the covenant and this is Israel had forgotten where the ark of the covenant had been placed and so verse 6 and 7 is rejoicing that the people had once again remembered and had found the ark of the covenant and that it now was sitting in the temple in Jerusalem it had been restored to its rightful place so as they celebrated verse 7 let us go to his dwelling place let us worship at his footstool. The people of Israel are rejoicing that they now can go and they have completed their pilgrimage that they may rejoice in the presence of God. You might read this as saying, let us go to God's home and let us worship at God's resting place. Verse 8 through 10 continues, Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place. You and the ark of your might, let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. And here again, the people of Israel are rejoicing that God now has his dwelling place in Israel. They have a physical temple that they can celebrate and go to for worship. In fact, verse 9 and 10 of Psalm 132 were spoken by Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 at the dedication of the first temple. This psalm, uh, it, it points back to this, these, this, this phrase, this celebration that Solomon used when the temple had first been completed. But here we see the first problem in this psalm. What are the requirements? What are, what are the people asking that God would do? Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Let your saints shout for joy. And we know that under the old covenant ceremonies, under the, the uh, sacrificial laws, there was a sense in which these animal sacrifices temporarily would cover the sin of the people. And yet we, we, we read under the Levitical laws that the priests, before they could offer sacrifices on behalf of the people, what did they have to do? They first had to purify themselves from their own sin. They had to offer these sacrifices to atone for their own sins that they had committed before they could possibly offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. So they're asking that God would clothe the priests with righteousness. And yet in these days, the righteousness that these sacrifices offered were temporary. They were outward. They were a sort of outward cleaning of the, the sinful body, but it did not penetrate to the heart. At the same time, these people are proclaiming, they say, let your saints shout for joy. And to what extent do we see that the people under the Old Covenant were, were saints? Well, again, there was this temporary purification for sin. There was no perfect purification, no perfect salvation, no true sense in which their idea as saints, right? Ones that are sent apart, ones that, ones that are holy. There was a sense in which this could only be temporary under the Old Covenant. And they say, for the sake of your servant, David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Again, for the sake of your servant, David. For the sake of the promise that God had made to King David, which we'll get to in just a moment, that he would have a son that would sit on his throne forever. They say, do not turn your face away from the anointed one. In the original language, this idea, this word anointed one is Mashiach, which literally is our word for Messiah. Do not turn your face away from your Messiah. Throughout the narrative of the Old Testament, we see that these people are, 
are brought up and, and the people of Israel are hoping beyond hope that this would be the one. This would be the Messiah. This would be the promised one who would crush the head of the serpent as was prophesied all the way at the beginning in the garden. That God would raise up the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. And certainly King David was who they were looking to and thinking maybe he is finally the one who will be our Messiah. Maybe he will be the conquering king who will rescue us from our enemies. And yet we know, of course, that David failed gloriously. Time and time again, David proved himself to not be the Messiah. Solomon demonstrated that he was not the one either. The judges, Moses, the prophets, none of them could perfectly fulfill this Messiah role that the people were waiting for. And so here we, even though in, in, encompassed in this idea of they are rejoicing, right? Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place. They are rejoicing that they have finally made it to the temple. There is still something left to be done for the fulfillment of this psalm. We move forward into verse 11. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. And here we see the promise of the Davidic covenant. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. Therefore, if your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit upon your throne. So after David had made this promise that he would not rest until he built a house for the Lord, in 2 Samuel 7, we read the account of the Davidic covenant in which God says, you are not going to build me a house because nothing can contain me on this earth, but I will build you a house. I will set your sons on the throne and I will establish your kingdom forever. Note here, it's too, it's, it's interesting. You can see it here in this psalm is that there's a dual nature to this promise that God made to David. The first is unconditional, right? One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. This is a promise on behalf of God to his chosen servant, David. One of your sons I will certainly set on your throne. Look at what the psalm says, right? He swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. This is a promise that God is making on behalf of his own character. And so this promise to David is completely unconditional. And yet there's also a conditional promise to this covenant as well. The second part of the verse, if your sons keep my covenant and if my and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. Boy, do we read the account of the history of the kings of of Israel and know that they failed Miserably in this promise to keep the covenant of God. So God's promise to David is completely unconditional that there would be a son of his that would sit on the throne forever. And yet God's promises to the sons of David was based on their righteousness and based on their obedience. And we know that they did not keep that part of the bargain. They did not keep the covenant of God, and therefore we know from the history of Israel exactly what happened. As you read through First and Second Kings, you see this downward spiral as the kings of Israel rebel against God time and time again, to the point where under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the kingdom is split in two. And then you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Israel who then continue to rebel against God until the time when Assyria from the north comes in and takes away the ten tribes of Israel. And Babylon from the south swoops in and takes away the two tribes of Judah. It's interesting, too, that you know, we, we, we can see from history that even though there was, again, a remnant from the southern kingdom that returned to Judah and to Israel, the northern kingdom was decimated was gone. In fact, sometimes they are called the lost tribes of Israel because there's no account of these ten tribes of the northern kingdom after the time of the exile. So we see here again that the king of Israel 
none of the kings of Israel could possibly be the true Messiah because all of them failed in keeping the covenant of God. And yet God, on his side of the covenant, this promise again to David, one of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. There must be some way that this is going to become true. Because so far at this point in Israel's history, they have not seen this happen. Look at verse 13 of Psalm 132. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. And her priests I will clothe with salvation. And her saints will shout for joy. You see, none of the kings of Israel specifically chose Zion for God. God chose Zion for himself. The promised land that was given to Abraham, again in the Abrahamic covenant, that God would give him a dwelling place forever and that his descendants would prosper as a nation to the point of being more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashores. God had chosen Zion to be his dwelling place forever. And when we see this phrase, this, this resting place, when God says, this will be my resting place, we know this isn't saying that God is going to cease from his work. This means that God is going to set aside this specific place for where his people would come and worship. Right On the seventh day when God rested after the six days of creation, it's not as though he just threw up his hands and said, all right, I'm done ruling the universe. He continued to rule and reign, and yet the seventh day was set aside specifically for the worship of his people to come together and join together in worship. We have to grasp this, though, it, though it's, it's, it's outside of our understanding that God owns and God rules over every square inch of the universe, and yet he would specifically choose a place. He would desire a specific place where he could dwell intentionally with his people. And in this place, you see again in this psalm, God promises such Wonderful things to the people. Look at what it says. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. This is exactly what the people had asked God to do, that the, 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 the priests of Israel would be clothed with righteousness, and God says, Yes, that is what I am going to do, and I will do it in Zion. I will bless this place where I dwell. I will give it abundance. I will bring the people satisfaction. I will provide a way of salvation, and my people will be given overwhelming joy. And yet, this promise of God was so much better than what the people of Israel could ever have imagined. And we'll get there in a moment. Psalm 132 ends with these two verses. There I will make a horn to sprout for David, for I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Keep in mind again, Although we know the continuing story of the history of Israel, this psalm is at the very beginning of the kingdom of Israel. They don't know what is coming. They are hoping beyond hope that the Messiah has already come who would bring them their peace. And this temple that was standing before them would have seemed to have indicated to the people that this is it. We have arrived at the fulfillment of what God has promised. This idea of this, this horn that would sprout for David. And this lamp 
Think of this, the, the, the anointing oil that would flow from the horn, that would drip down upon the priest and upon the king as they were anointed by God. And this promise, right, his enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. This promise of this great and perfect king. And this is a song that the people of Israel, they didn't just sing it once. They sang it year upon year, rejoicing. But put yourselves in the mind of the Israelites who are now in exile. What are they thinking when they sing to one another this psalm? Or when they consider the words that this psalm says, and yet everything before them says, well, God, God failed on this promise. God did not fulfill this promise because our temple is gone. Our land is devastated, and we are living in a foreign land, serving foreign gods, surrounded by foreign people. It is a joy to be on this side of the resurrection. It is a joy as we can consider that Israel, in the singing of this psalm, they did not recognize, although it meant so much for them as they looked at the temple of God, as we have the continued and the finished story, the finished revelation from God, knowing that Jesus Christ fulfills this psalm so perfectly. Let us consider four ways in which this psalm points to Jesus Christ. First, as verse 1 through 5 of Psalm 132 speak of rejoicing in the temple, we know that Jesus is the true and the perfect temple. In fact, as Jesus, as he was walking around on this earth during his ministry, the scribes and Pharisees came to him and pointed out the temple, and Jesus said in John chapter 2, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. <laughs> scribes and the Pharisees say, what are you talking about? It took our forefathers decades to build this second temple, and you say you're going to raise it up again by yourself in three days, and Jesus explains to the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, no, I am the true temple. He's telling them, I am now the true place where God dwells in your midst. It is no wonder why the scribes and the Pharisees considered this to be blasphemous. Which, if it was not true, it certainly would have been, but we know that Christ was the very presence of God in the midst of the people. When Jesus takes James and John and Peter up the mountain and we see his transfiguration, and scripture says that the glory of God radiated from his body, the same glory that would have been in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. The same glory that shone forth from the temple that Moses, as he descended Mount Sinai, after he had looked upon the glory of God, just the, the, the trail of God's glory, and his face shined, this is the same glory that Jesus Christ showed his three disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. Likewise, when Christ died on the cross, amidst all the events that took place, one of the things that took place, as we know, reading the Gospels, is that the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. The Holy of Holies was now accessible to all people. The veil between God and man was no more because Jesus in his perfect death did away with the dividing wall of hostility between God and humanity. Throughout his ministry, God, uh, or Jesus, he fulfilled and perfectly became the temple, the new temple of God. Secondly, as the people of Israel in Psalm 132 rejoiced in the finding and the restoration of the ark, we see Jesus Christ as the true and perfect ark of God. For again, what did the ark symbolize? The ark that the people carried around with them, that dwelled with them in the wilderness and in the tabernacle and into the temple. The ark that, when it was brought into the midst of enemy territory, caused pestilence and plague and destruction. 
The ark that when it was brought into the presence of pagan gods decimated them. The ark was the very presence of God, the worship place of the people of Israel. And what do the angels proclaim as they visited the shepherds? We just heard it sung by our choir this morning. Emmanuel, God with us. The angels declare that this babe in the manger was the one who came. He was the new place where God was present so that God would dwell with the people. And of course, the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, the, the, the cover, if you're familiar, was called the mercy seat, the place where the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled one day a year, the Day of Atonement, so that the people would be purified from their sins, right? The one day of the year when the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat so that God might have mercy upon them. And boy, do we see Jesus Christ exemplified there as the one who became the ultimate atonement for our sin. As he became the one whose blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat in his sacrificial death upon the cross. And we also see the contents of the ark, right? We consider that the ark was, was meant to carry something. There were three items in the ark of the covenant that point us to Christ. First, we see the jar of manna, right? The bread that Israel was provided in the wilderness. Jesus calls himself in his earthly ministry. He says, I am the true bread of life who has come to provide nourishment and sustenance for all who would trust in me. The Ark of the Covenant also contained Aaron's staff that had budded, which confirmed Aaron as God's choice for high priest. And we see Jesus time and time again referred to as the great high priest and God's confirmation of him as the one who would atone on behalf of his people. And thirdly, the, the, the two tablets of stone, the law of God that God gave to Moses on which the Ten Commandments were written. And Christ comes onto the scene and says, I did not come to abandon the law. I did not come to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill it. Jesus Christ, our perfect spotless lamb, who because of his complete perfect keeping of the law of God was able to become that lamb sacrificed on the behalf of all of his people. So we see that Jesus in his life, death, burial, and resurrection became the true and the perfect ark of God, even as he instituted in himself the new covenant. As Pastor JJ said this morning, we are celebrating a season of newness, and Jesus brought so much that was new to his people. As God promised in Psalm 132 that there would be a king who would come and sit on the throne of David, we know that Jesus is the true and perfect king in the line of David. Why is it that two out of four of our gospels start with genealogies, which oftentimes when we get to them, we're like, skip, and we, we say, I'm not going to get anything out of those, and we just continue on in the story. But two times in Scripture, David or uh, Jesus' genealogy is traced all the way back to King David to demonstrate that he is the one whom God promised that would, through the line of David, sit upon his throne. And yet here we have a king that far exceeds what the people could possibly have imagined for Christ is given an everlasting kingdom. We read about this in Daniel chapter 7. Right? He's been given a kingdom that has no bounds, no ends. It has no geographical boundaries, but a kingdom that cannot be shaken and cannot be broken by the empires of this world that war against it. Christ spoke so much during his ministry and saying the kingdom of God has come among you as I now live and breathe among you. Christ spoke that he had inaugurated the kingdom of God in his ministry. 
and even more as Christ rose from the dead and ascended back to the right hand of the Father, where he is now presently reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as he is now sitting on the throne and ruling as the King. He became the fulfillment of this Davidic covenant that far exceeded what the people could ever have imagined. So we see that Jesus is the true and perfect king on behalf of his people. And if this psalm points us to anything, it is the reality that Jesus is our perfect and true dwelling place. When sinners are brought into the family of God, Scripture time and ta- time and time again uses this language of our union with Christ, right? right? We are adopted into the family of God. We become brothers and sisters. Christ, it speaks of him as our older brother. God is spoken of as our father. Scripture speaks of our union with Christ as when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sinful record, but instead he sees Christ's perfect righteousness. This is how closely united we are with our Savior. And so we abide in Christ, right? John chapter 15, Jesus says, abide in me and I also in you. For as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And Christ, even when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sat enthroned as the King of Kings, he did not leave us on our own, right? He told his disciples, it is better that I go, for I'm going to send the Helper, who will indwell you and will empower you to proclaim the gospel in a mighty way. And so as we are united with Christ, we also are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, who indwells us as believers, so that we might be bold to proclaim the gospel, might be moved to repent from our sinfulness, right? We are given this Holy Spirit so that we too, as the people of God, become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And finally, God gives us each other. God has given us the church so that the church might be what's been called the, ambas- the, uh, the, the embassy of the kingdom of God on this earth, the people of God, as we are united together as brothers and sisters, because we find our perfect dwelling place in Jesus Christ, that means that those of us who are under the lordship of Christ have the most important thing in common with one another that we could possibly have. And as we look forward, Right, as we consider what Scripture says about Israel's delighting in the dwelling place of God in Israel, and as we have been given and been invited into the dwelling place of God, we look forward to that day. When, as Revelation says, the dwelling place of God is with man, we look forward to that day when the new heavens and the new earth come down and come into reality. Jesus, as he was getting ready to ascend back into heaven, he said to his disciples, I am going and I am preparing a place in my father's house for you. And that is true for any of us who trust and rely in Jesus Christ, that we have an eternal dwelling place in the presence of our almighty God. As we consider Psalm 132, we see that Jesus Christ jumps off the page in almost, I would probably say, in every verse from beginning to end, we see Christ as the perfect fulfillment of what the Israelites were singing about, as the Messiah who came and became the perfect temple and the perfect ark and the perfect king and the perfect place where God would dwell with us as we have just celebrated the Christmas season. Unlike Christian in in Pilgrim's Progress. As he considered that the danger that lay ahead of him was nothing in comparison to the danger that might lay behind him if he returned to his old ways, he knew it would be difficult. 
He knew that in this life he would have trials, and yet the end result of being able to dwell with his king in the celestial city was worth everything that life would throw at him. And like Christian, we know, we know what scripture tells us, that in this life, we're going to face trials. We're going to face persecution. We will face nakedness and famine and sword, and yet the end of the result is that we have an eternal dwelling place to look forward to because Jesus Christ is our perfect dwelling place. And he has, been, he has given us that gift. He has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. He has given us the gift of one another. And just as surely as he fulfilled the promises of God to David, we know that he will fulfill his promise that one day he will return again. If you are in this room, and if you are still separated from God because of your sinfulness, because of your rebellion. It's my prayer that the words of Psalm 132 would demonstrate that there is a rest that is open and available to you in Jesus Christ. And the gospel is not that you have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. That's what the world tells us. It's that you've got to get yourself, do enough good works, or make your way clean enough before you come to whatever their idea of salvation looks like. The gospel is that Jesus cleaned you up already, and then you come to him. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And likewise, brothers and sisters, in our daily walk, may Psalm 132 remind us and encourage us to delight in Christ as our true dwelling place, our true resting place, knowing that God has given us a Savior who fills all of his promises and also grants us and gives us an eternal hope and an eternal home for our souls as we look forward to the day when one day we shall dwell with him in glory. Will you pray with me? Lord, you are matchless. You have given us and have woven your story of redemption so clearly through every page of Scripture. And we thank you. I thank you, Lord, for Psalm 132. I thank you for these words that were sung by the nation of Israel thousands of years ago as they arrived into Jerusalem and looked at the temple. Lord, I thank you that that temple was not the ultimate reality, but that your plan for your people was so much better than a building in Jerusalem, but that you sent your son. You sent your son to make an atonement for our sins, to become the king, the priest, the prophet, the one who would perfectly bring your kingdom into our world. Lord, we thank you for the promises of Psalm 132. Lord, we pray that as the busyness of life moves forward, that we would dwell in your presence and that we would find all of our delight in this life in dwelling in your presence and knowing that you have given us such a, such a gift, such a mighty promise. And Lord, may we live in light of your second coming. May we live in light of eternity, recognizing that one day the dwelling place of God will be with man in all of its fullness. As we rejoice around the throne of God and take part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, may that be our hope this day as we head into the new year. May you give us strength and confidence and hope as we look to you and trust in you alone. And it's in the great and matchless name of our prophet, priest, and king, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.